I'm Mike Jafrida from Kyber Security, um, and uh, we are, we've been a partner at Tango for uh, quite some time, uh, really looking forward to uh, bringing some benefit to the members of Tango, uh, as we really truly believe in the non-for-profit um, world and the missions that, uh, that you're out there to, uh, to achieve. So um, thank you all for doing what you do, and uh, let's see how uh, maybe we can uh, give you a little education help. You can go ahead and change. Okay. So a uh, few things we want to want you to get out of today. Uh, the first is understanding why uh, hackers would want your information at all, um, how they're going to try to get it, and then what you can do to try to stop them. Uh, essentially, we're going to try to teach you to think like a hacker so you don't wind up exposing your donor information, uh, which, uh, as we understand, is one of your most precious resources. Change. Click. There you go. Um, so, uh, oftentimes people say, well, I'm not sure if this is right for me. I'm not sure if I'm really uh, at risk. So, uh, we put together a quick little bullet list here of things, activities you might be doing in your organizations. Um, and if you are, this information is for you. So, if you're collecting any donations online, if you're collecting event registrations, uh, any medical or personal information collecting online, if you have systems that store any medical or personal information or collect information about donor habits or preferences, or even if you send out a newsletter, which means you have some database of donor information, then this is for you because you are a target. Go ahead and click. So a uh, quick little background on Kyber uh, for anybody who's not familiar with us. Um, you may have known of our organization over the past several decades, 30-something years, as Connect Computer. Um, Connect Computer has been in the um, tri-state marketplace supporting small, medium-sized businesses and non-for-profit organizations, um, and really was focused on keeping organizations' technology up and running over all those years. We were a support-focused organization, and while we um, certainly did things to secure uh, the infrastructures that we were supporting, security was really a secondary um, methodology. Uh, a few years back, um, we really flipped the whole organization on its head and went with a security first methodology when our CEO, Lynn Souza, who some of you may know, um, she really looked out and, and realized that the small, medium sized organizations out there are really the biggest targets for hackers. And just being a support company wasn't enough anymore for us to feel like we were doing the right thing to, to keep our um, to keep our clients safe. So um, we rebranded as Kyber Security and and like I say, flipped that whole uh, um, methodology on its head so that security was the first thing we were thinking about every time we approached an organization. Click. Yep. So. The way we did this was we hired a hacker to help us understand how they how they act in their effort to infiltrate and monetize a small, medium sized business. And we did this starting by drawing out a sample small, medium sized network because they're not designed the same as enterprise networks. And we wanted to make sure we were designing a program that was going to protect the kind of assets that you have out there. Um, the, the big thing that people uh, often miss is that well, you're maybe not Citigroup or, or uh, one of the large organizations, insurance companies out there. You have treasure on your, um, on your network. And if a hacker can get at your treasure and add that together with the treasure of several other small organizations, they can actually yield just as much profit with much less risk and skill. Uh, I think we're a couple of clicks behind here, Rob. Click. There's some transitions in there. Oh, you got the animations. Okay. There you go. Um, and so uh, the the key uh, is to is to try to make it more difficult for a hacker to get um, at your treasure because if you can do that, then you can deter them so they'll use their efforts somewhere else. You can click. Uh, go ahead and click again. Uh, the way we did this was walking through a. Um, through the network with a hacker and saying, okay, what's the first thing you would do to try to um, infiltrate a network? Okay, how would we stop you? What would be next if you got past that? 
And we went step by step through the different types of vulnerabilities and techniques like finding credentials on the dark web or looking for open ports in a firewall or are there default credentials used on things like printers and switches? Um, do they encrypt their data? Are there employees visiting websites that are prone to compromise? Uh, basically looking through all the different attack vectors and trying to find ways to stop all of the different methodologies they would use to try to attack your network. You can go ahead and click. Yep. By doing that, we developed a defense in depth um, proposition. Uh, click one more time. Okay. There we go. One more? Yeah, go ahead. Just let the, let the transitions go. Um, so what we did was we looked for all of these methodologies that they would use. We looked for um, tools and processes and procedures that would help prevent that from becoming a problem and created layers of security where we could reduce the attack vectors or the attack surface on your network as much as possible, basically trying to deter them. There's no 100% solution, but if you make it difficult enough, Hopefully they'll just move on. The last thing we did is really integrate a, um, a thorough comprehensive employee awareness training uh, as part of what needs to be part of every cybersecurity program for every organization anywhere. If you can get your team thinking about cybersecurity so it's part of your culture, what could have been your greatest weakness can now become your greatest strength. If, if we're looking at the network from a hacker's point of view, it gives them the ability to stop potential issues before they start. So checkpoint one, first thing we wanted to make sure is you understand why a hacker might want your information. You might be thinking, we're a small organization, they're not after me. The reality is it's the exact opposite of that. You're low hanging fruit if you haven't done things to protect that information. So let's talk now about uh, how they're going to try to get that information from you. So I thought I might start with a little bit of a backstory, uh, it, it, um, an example of an actual non-for-profit organization um, who we spoke with after we saw them at, uh, at an event. Um, and they fell in love with our CEO, Lynn, who most people do once they speak with her once. And they said, great, we want to we want to work with you guys. However, once they started exploring what, uh, you know, what we wanted to put in place, they said, we really don't have the budget to go through and, and do all of this. Um, so we tried to help them understand that obviously, you know, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, and it's more expensive to clean things up than it is to prevent them um, at being a non-for-profit and, and looking at, you know, a fixed amount of income, they said, okay, we, we don't really have the budget to proceed. And they went and hired a traditional support provider. Um, you can click a couple of times. Um, the unfortunate part that happened is nine months later, they were a victim of a ransomware breach. Um, and still being in contact with them, um, we, we started to hear what was going on. You can go ahead and click. Uh, during the time of the breach, um, they were down for over a month. Uh, they lost data. They were legally obligated to report the breach to the attorney general. They lost funding and opportunities. They had to pay their MSP to have their systems recovered. And you can't see my air quotes there. I should have put them on the slide. Um, but they also found that their backups were incomplete, partially corrupted. So they, they really didn't even recover as much as they thought they did. Uh, after reaching out to us, they said, hey, you know what? It's time. Let's go through and let's get this, you know, let's get this network protected so it doesn't happen again. Turned out once we got in there that their clean network was still very infected. Um, there was actually uh, active uh, data being exfiltrated to a foreign country. And uh, every time we went to clean up uh, and close up the holes of what was happening, they opened up another one somewhere else. So they were so deep in this network because they had so much time to, um, to infiltrate what was in there that they were, it was almost impossible to get them out. Ultimately, while we were able to slow them down, we determined that rebuilding the network from scratch was really the only 100% cure uh, to trying to get these people out of there. Um, and we basically started with uh, all new data, um, I mean, sorry, all new equipment, scrubbed all the data before we can move it from one to the other. And um, ultimately, this was a huge expense to the organization, hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time this was all done. 
Um, and, and really a sad story from taking the resources out of the pockets of an organization who was really trying to do some good um, because some threat actor decided, you know, that's where they were going to, they found some low hanging fruit, decided to try to get, uh, um, you know, get, get their, uh, get their money there. So go ahead and click. There's a saying we use in the business once breached, always breached that even if you've recovered, um, it's very difficult to know whether or not you're actually secure because hackers find ways to get deep into the underpinnings of the, of the uh, network and uh, makes it difficult to find. So um, anyway, we're here today to talk about the kinds of threats that come in um, and, and what you can do to stop them. So the top three cyber threats uh, that, that have been um, clocked for 2020 um, based upon reports from uh, IC3 are business email compromise, confidence fraud, and ransomware. And you've probably heard of all of these in one way or another in different forms. We're going to talk about each of them individually. Um, billions and billions of dollars in losses reported. And that's just the, the amounts that uh, can be calculated in dollars and cents. Doesn't count things like reputation loss, um, you know, lost opportunities, all those types of things that are uh, a little harder to, uh, to quantify. So let's, uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about business email compromise. This one is on the rise and is one of the um, most common things happening to organizations today. Uh, essentially, a hacker will uh, identify their target and usually it's somebody who has uh, some sort of access to uh, uh, money in an organization. Uh, so maybe a CFO or a control or even a, a clerk and um, they'll find a way to try to get into these people's email boxes. So they'll send up some phishing emails, different things to do to be able to take over their email box. When they take the box over, they create forwarding rules in the email box that essentially take every email you receive and forwards it off to them. So they can sit there and just sit around and watch what's happening. And then when they see the email about that, funds transfer, whether that's a donation or a payment to a vendor or some other electronic payment, they insert themselves in the middle of the conversation and take you off of the conversation. And so now they can direct that wire transfer wherever they want to direct it. Um, and, and if nobody's paying attention, get away uh, by taking the money and, and uh, moving it between multiple accounts until for it never to be found again. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, Fairly sophisticated uh, technique, but it's not that difficult these days for uh, hackers to be able to uh, find ways into someone's mailbox if they're not properly protected or they're not monitoring for this type of activity. Um, so business email compromise, a big one happening now. Uh, it happens all the time, um, and it has happened to organizations we know um, here in Connecticut uh, on a regular basis. It's not, uh, it's not uncommon, and being vigilant and monitoring for that information um, is uh, is pretty important. Let's move on to confidence fraud, Rob. Uh, confidence fraud uh, is actually far less technical in most cases than some of the other breach tactics, although can be um, just as uh, just as harmful. Um, as a matter of fact, th this is where they will take and impersonate someone in an organization, the president, the CEO, someone with a title that uh, may make requests of others in the organization on a regular basis. And they'll apply some pressure to the victim and, and make it sound time sensitive. So um, after we wrote this slide, uh, just uh, I think it was the end of last week or the beginning of this week, um, all of my employees got an email that said it was from me. Now, my email box had not been compromised. They were using another bogus email address, but there's a way to spoof the name of who it is. And it said, uh, everybody got one, which is, of course, the first mistake the hacker made because the people talk to each other. But it said, uh, hey, I, I need a favor. I need it really fast. Um, could you please reach out to me quietly so that you can take care of this for me or something to that effect? And of course, people in our organization are pretty aware of this type of thing. Um, you know, they all jumped up and said, hey, Mike, what's going on? Um, but for if you're not paying attention or if you're not watching that that wasn't my email address or this isn't part of the culture in the organization, 
Real easy for somebody to at least reply and say, sure, what do you need? They're, they're working fast. They got 600 emails in there. They see one from the boss and you know they want to be helpful. So once you reply to one of those emails, um, very, it basically validates the email address that is sent to you as okay, which means that any future things that they send you are not likely going to get stopped by your spam software or your filtering software because you're already in conversation with these people, which is one of the indicators of a valid conversation. So the first request is not usually, can you buy me gift cards? The first request is, can you do something for me? And then they start the conversation afterwards and they say, hey, I need you to get me 10 $100 gift cards because I'm in this meeting and I want to give out something to all the participants of the meeting. Um, but just send me the codes and I'll give each one of them a code. Um, this happens all the time. It sounds silly when we talk about it. Um, you know, who would fall for that? It happens all the time. And so that's, a, uh, that's an example of confidence fraud. Another one which um, is, you know, less common um, I think that people talk about, but I think it happens more often than you'd think is tech support fraud. So someone might call up one of your uh, staff and say, hey, this is Mike from tech support. I'm, uh, I'm seeing a ping here from your machine. Looks like maybe a patch is, is missing. Um, I'm going to send you a code to get onto a website so I can jump into your machine and, uh, and just apply that patch real fast. Is that okay? Most people, again, in their frenzy, in their hurry, they want to just get it done. How those tech guys, whatever, they don't validate that it's actually from your actual managed service provider. They'll just go ahead and do it, being good little soldiers. And uh, bam, now the uh, attacker is on your machine, can plant their malware, and they've got control over what's going on. Um, not high tech things, but things that you really need to be vigilant to make sure aren't happening in the organization. Go ahead and click. Last one here is ransomware. Everybody's heard of ransomware. I just talked about a ransomware example. Um, every time I read this stat, it blows my mind, but a new ransomware attack is occurring every 14 seconds. There's that many of them. They're saying by 2021, it'll be every 11 seconds. Um, it's just, it's constant. This is an easy way. You can go on the dark web and buy ransomware as an amateur hacker and send it out and hope somebody clicks on it. It's just so easy for folks to um, for malicious folks to decide they want to try this out and give it and uh, and see what happens that um, it's just come, become very pervasive uh, and and uh, you know we can't tell people enough um, to train their people to watch for malicious emails for bogus emails and uh, and make sure that that uh, regardless of what type of urgency something uh, says it has you've got to be able to stop and think if there's any emails coming from someone you don't know or a strange communication coming from even someone you think you do know. Um, the worst thing about ransomware, sorry, that, that's okay. The worst thing about ransomware um, also that's happening a lot now is that um, even if you manage to get the Bitcoin and pay the ransom, there's really no guarantee you're actually going to get your data back. And there are many, many documented examples of places where somebody paid the ransomware and the hacker still didn't unlock the data, or they paid the ransomware, the data was unlocked, but the hacker still decided to sell it on the dark web. Because once they have it, you know, these are, these are not uh, ethical people. Um, there's no guarantees that, uh, that they're gonna act in the way that they indicated they were going to. So uh, again, prevention, uh, prevention, prevention is the way to make sure this isn't happening uh, to your organization. So. Three of the big targets within your um, within your networks that are happening now. Uh, one is the first one's out of date technology. You all probably heard last year if you had older servers or older um, Windows desktops. Um, this, this was particularly um, expansive in not for profits because with limited budgets, they they tend to stretch out technology as long as they can before they replace it. Well, Windows Seven and Server two thousand eight went out of. Um, support uh, beginning of this year by Microsoft, which means that they're not um, developing and delivering any more patches for those operating systems. So as soon as this, the next um, security hole was discovered and it becomes general knowledge, it's just an open hole for hackers to get at because there's not going to be a patch. There is no patch for it um, being um, being automatically sent in uh, or applied by your managed service providers to this out of out of tech technology. So um, 
those are those are things that if they're in your networks today, you need to address them. You need to make sure you're getting rid of them. Uh, the, the second one, which we've talked uh, quite a bit about already, is untrained or uninformed staff or volunteers. These email-based scams are getting better and better and better. And uh, really, the only way to avoid falling victim to them is by training your staff early and often um, and, and using technology to um, test whether or not they're paying attention. Um, and uh, you, you can run a mock phishing um, tests on the team to see, all right, who, who's clicking on this stuff because they're really not taking this seriously and then be able to provide more training. The last piece here around supply chain, um, you don't hear as much about this, although this is uh, certainly a um, uh, big news when it does happen. Uh, one of the bigger ones everybody knows about is uh, Target. When Target was breached, it was through a third party, I think it was an HVAC vendor who uh, managed to get into their, you know, a, a malicious person managed to get in through the HVAC vendor into the Target network. and. Uh, obviously wreaked all kind of havoc there and, uh, and compromised all the target cards and that type of a thing. One that's a little closer to home here in the not-for-profit world, um, you may have heard just this year, Blackboard, which is a popular uh, fundraising donor management system, um, was a victim of ransomware. And so if all of your data is in one of those systems um, and whether, whether you were the door to get in or somebody else was, um, if the data is in there, uh, could be victim for attack. Um, same with any other third party who has access into your systems, um, they could be the door in. So you want to make sure that you're vetting those third parties and you're making sure that, um, you know, vigilance is, is uh, affected everywhere. Okay, so uh, checkpoint number two, we talked first about why hackers want your information. There's some, uh, uh, several different examples, details, and techniques about how they're going to try to get it. Now let's get to the fun part. How can you stop them? Right? I keep talking about being vigilant and um, working to make sure that um, you know, you're, you're ahead of the game on these guys. Let's talk about what you can actually do. So back to the title, start thinking like a hacker. Um, by the information that we provided today, this is how hackers are thinking. This is what they're thinking about. You need to be thinking this way to try to stop them. All right, so start by engaging in regular cybersecurity awareness training. Do phishing tests on your team, social engineering um, if appropriate. Uh, make sure that um, your, they understand the, the um, potential issues if they don't have um, unique passwords everywhere and a password gets compromised. Uh, now they're using that password for everything and, and now someone can get into any of the different systems, web-based or local, that, you, that they have in their machines. Cyber awareness training is not just about phishing. It's about ways to be vigilant to understand how to avoid putting your organization and your donor data at risk. Uh, many um, compliance regulations require cybersecurity training. Any of you in the healthcare space, um, you know, uh, probably subject to HIPAA. Um, if you're doing international, uh, you're probably subject to GDPR, um, and, and oftentimes even just the insurance that you have will require you're doing uh, cybersecurity awareness training. But at the end of the day, it's just good practice. It's just smart to try to make this part of the culture in the organization because 63% of all breaches are due to some employee negligence somehow. It's not, uh, it's not October yet, by the way, but October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, so uh, we're leaking up to that right around the corner next week, a good opportunity and time for you to start thinking about this with your people. There's plenty of resources on the web um, around different ways to do cybersecurity awareness training. Um, for the, uh, the second pillar here, uh, something that we uh, prescribed to or subscribed to is following a well-known framework. Um, the one that we follow is the NIST cybersecurity framework. That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And this is a list of best practices um, that you should follow to protect your organization. Uh, this is not a compliance. This is not something you can get certified in, but it's a set of tools for you to use for your organization. And if you're following a framework, it will allow you to 
make sure that you're seeing the, the potential vulnerabilities in the network, not just doing one or two things and hoping that you're secure or believing when somebody says, oh, you're all set because you've got X. Well, that may be helpful. However, following a framework will allow you to at least take a look and evaluate all the different uh, pillars that are necessary um, in, uh, in protecting your network. Uh, the other thing that this particular framework does is it provides a common language to communicate cybersecurity risk to stakeholders. And in your world, those stakeholders could be the board. So if you're trying to get into the budget proper cybersecurity protections for your organization, one way to do it is to utilize something with a framework that uses business language to talk about cyber risk and it, it, it's a tool to use to be able to communicate that to the board so they can understand just how important it is to make sure you have the budget and you don't wind up being another example of, of an organization who thought they couldn't afford it, but it turned out they couldn't afford not to have it. Go ahead and click. Um, and, and this is really sort of the juxta of everything is that regardless of what you're doing, you ought to have a plan for moving forward. Um, the way we recommend you do that is going through a gap analysis against a framework like that NIST cybersecurity framework we just talked about and making informed decisions about the things that you can do, that you need to do, that you'd like to do, putting a time frame together for how you, how you think you can get those done, getting the most critical things taken care of first and and uh, delaying some of the others that you'd like to do until you have the budget to do them if they're not as critical. But, but have a plan. Make this an active part of your business conversation. You, you, you go through and you do planning on new programs. You plan on your budget. You plan on your staffing. This is something that should be part of your plan. This should be an intentional effort for every organization today because if, if you don't make it an intentional effort, an attacker making an intentional effort, is going to make an example out of you, which you really want to avoid at all at all costs. So um, I often get the question, "Okay, Mike, this is you know this is really um, great stuff, and we might be able to get to this next month. But what can I do today? Like, give me some really tangible things. Like, I can knock down some pens today. Um, the first one that I like to talk about about is multi-factor authentication. This is where um, you, when you log into something, you, you'll get a text or there's an app that gives it has a second piece of information and you have to type that information in so it knows that this is something you know and something you have. Those are the two factors. So that if somebody winds up with your password, it's not that easy for them to also have the second factor to be able to log in. And this is not just to your computer. This is to, to every software application online that you use, every website that you log into. Anywhere that multi-factor is available, you should be enabling it. And if, I don't care if that's your Gmail or your personal uh, places that you're using, uh, using passwords to log in. Certainly your bank probably requires it. If it's there, it's low-hanging fruit. Go ahead and enable it. it and, and then uh, you should look at, if you don't already have, a program for this also to work for um, logging into your computers in the network. Uh, and and making sure that all of those logins are protected as well. Again, multi-factor is it's it's basically uh, you know bread and butter today for cybersecurity. Everybody ought to be doing it. Second thing you can do, and you can do this for free, um, is check the dark web and see if you have any exposed data out there today. Um, there's free services uh, that do it. Uh, we'll even do one for you if you'd like. Um, but we can do a search for your domain name and look to see, is there any compromised credentials out there today? And even if your network hasn't been hacked, um, it's not unusual to have your data be out there because you used your business email for, let's say, your LinkedIn account and LinkedIn got hacked. And so now if you used a similar password as well, your username and password they use for LinkedIn is out there. That might also be what you use to log into your computer. You want to find out if any of that data is out there publicly available um, and make sure that any of those passwords that have been compromised are changed. That's low hanging fruit. You can do it today. Um, the next one goes to this business email compromise and, and looking to monitor your, your email boxes for this. This is 
Um, there's a lot of different services that offer this now um, as part of a program or um, just separately, individually. Um, it's, it's not a high uh, investment to be able to do this, but if you're using something like G Suite or Office 365, they can plug right in um, to your, uh, your web-based mail product and uh, monitor the boxes for things like um, those suspicious forwarding rules that I, uh, that I talked about or um, suspicious login activity. Uh, so let's say you log in in Connecticut and then three hours later you log in in Russia hmm, that's not likely that you got that quickly from U.S. to Russia, that would throw up a flag. Um, or mass downloads of emails, which would could mean that either an attack is um, downloading your mailbox, or it could mean even that an employee is downloading their mailbox, and that might be something you want to know about. So uh, again, they're, they're inexpensive services. There's something that you ought to be looking at today for your organizations. Um, and the last one, I can't talk about this enough, is comprehensive employee awareness program. Find ways to make this part of your culture. There are, again, plenty of places where you can get free information. There's low cost programs you can engage in. Um, and uh, Amber actually even added on here as our, our tribute to Cybersecurity Awareness Month next month, we're holding an event called Crack the Hack, um, where we're providing uh, interactive cybersecurity awareness training for free. Um, if any of you want to get involved in that, uh, we'll figure out ways to connect uh, on that later. But uh, this is sort of a combination of uh, the game Clue meets um, an escape room. And so it's a little more interesting than just watching another webinar like you're doing today. But it's, uh, it's you got to find clues and, and solve, the, uh, solve the mystery along the course of the, uh, of course of the week and uh, learning about different um, common ways that hackers are trying to compromise, uh, compromise your data. Okay, checkpoint number three, we talked about understanding why hackers want your information, how they're gonna try to get it, and the things you can do to them. I believe I've covered all three of those topics. Rob, I'm not sure what your platform is uh, for, um, for questions or close out after here, but uh, I thank you all for listening to me so far today and uh, if there's any, ever anything I can do to help any of you um, try to understand what's going on in your world, uh, some sort of an assessment, uh, um, you know, those are things that uh, that we can try to help with as well. Uh, we want you, we want to help you fight the good fight. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, we are a smaller group here, so uh, we can certainly take questions. If any of you have questions, uh, you can unmute your micro microphones. Joe, if you can monitor the little message box at the bottom, do you see any questions there? I can't see while, while I'm in full screen mode. No? Okay, so. No, no question okay. via okay. chat. So thanks for attending today. Um, sorry for the technical glitch there at the beginning. Uh, I just want everybody to know our partners are here for you. Um, they truly care about the nonprofit sector. So, you know, feel free to reach out Mike to Mike and the Kyber team or any of our partners directly. All their information is on our website. And, you know, if you're ever in any need of uh, our partner services, uh, they're here for you. And also, lastly, don't forget to um, register for the annual conference this year on October 21st. And that's pretty much it. So thanks again for attending. And